Hi everyone, in this lecture 2, two different ways to describe a semiconductor device are introduced. They are a compact model and the device simulation. First, we discuss compact models. Compact models are based on analytic expressions. I want to emphasize that compact models are critically important. We have billions of transistors in a chip. Even in a small circuit, we have multiple transistors. Therefore, in order to perform the circuit analysis, an efficient model for a transistor is needed. Yes, compact model is efficient because it considers only terminal quantities such as terminal voltages and current. Of course, since the device operation is determined by physical rules, model expressions in a compact model should be developed to describe these rules efficiently. Anyway, without compact models, circuit designers cannot design circuits Please do not underestimate the importance of compact models. Our following discussion is not for circuit designers, it's for device engineers. Let's get started with a very successful model for the double gate MOS structure. A silicon channel is sandwiched by two gate oxide layers. Even a fin fat or a nanoshin MOSFET has a channel cross section quite similar with the double gate MOS. We must know the charge due to the inversion electrons Q sub E as a function of the gate voltage. When the channel is intrinsic, an analytic solution is available. The solution was first reported in Professor Yuan Tao's EDL paper. The surface potential phi sub s and the center potential phi sub naught can be calculated by solving the two equations shown here. Well, these equations look quite complicated and they are nonlinear equations. Anyway, these equations are exact and this work was a real breakthrough in the compact modeling. However, it is very easy to make the problem even more difficult. For example, doping. In Professor Tao's work, an intrinsic channel was assumed. When the substrate is doped, an analytic solution is not available. Or simply, when the quantum confinement effect is considered, an analytic solution is not available. How about the trigate MOS structure? An analytic solution is not available. The intrinsic double gate MOS is really a rare lucky case. In most cases, we have to adopt several approximations to model the device. A good modeling expert uses a good approximation when it is really needed. The inversion charge modeling is just one of several items to be covered in the compact modeling. In this slide, physical effects to be covered in a compact transistor model are listed. For each of them, we must introduce an appropriate model manually. Up to now, we have discussed the difficulties about developing a compact model. To maintain a compact form, we must introduce several approximations. So, you may think that it is not very 
accurate due to several approximations. But compact models are always very accurate. Why? A compact model has many parameters. For example, the BSIM CMG model has more than 1,000 parameters. These parameters are extensively calibrated to fit the experimental result. Then, with such an accurate compact model, can we develop the next generation technology? Unfortunately, compact models are accurate only within the calibration range. They are not suitable for prediction. More importantly, in these days, the device's structure itself has been changed greatly from a planar MOSFET to a FinFET and a nanosheet MOSFET. What will be the next one? As a device engineer, we must find a path toward the next generation technology, which has advantages in terms of power, performance, and area, PPA. We need a more detailed way to describe a semiconductor device. The device simulation is used for this purpose. In this field, we are interested with physical position-dependent quantities inside the semiconductor device. The terminal characteristics are naturally obtained from the simulation result. Let me introduce an analogy with describing a car operation. For driver, it is quite simple. By pressing the gas pedal, the car is accelerated. By pressing the brake pedal, the car is slowed down and or stopped. But the manufacturer's view is completely different. We must consider all the parts in it. Interaction between them is important. Optimization of each part for better performance is possible. This view is much more detailed. These two different views are corresponding to the compact model and the device simulation, respectively. The difference comes from the spatial resolution. As shown in a previous slide, the compact model tried to express the inversion charge density as a function of the gate voltage. It does not consider the position-dependent electron density. On the other hand, in the device simulation, we can calculate the electron density n of r at every position by integrating it over the cross-section, the inversion charge density can be easily evaluated. This is the key difference. Usually, a three-dimensional device structure is quite complicated. In this slide, a planar MOSFET is shown. Even in this case, the three-dimensional structure is not trivial at all. It has several materials and doping profile rapidly changes. In order to describe such a complicated structure, usually the semiconductor device simulator adopts the unstructured mesh. In the unstructured mesh, sets of tetrahedra are introduced to describe various three-dimensional shapes. Each tetrahedron has four vertices. Scalar quantities are defined on those vertices. The fundamental quantities in the semiconductor device simulation are the electrostatic potential phi, the electron density n, and the hole density p. The potential is defined on both the semiconductor and insulator regions. On the other hand, the carrier densities 
are defined only on semiconductor regions. In order to calculate the electrostatic potential, we must solve Gauss's law. The displacement vector D is written in terms of electrostatic potential. With this form, Gauss's law can be written as a generalized Poisson equation. Also, the net charge density law can be expressed with the carrier densities. The ionized impurity density, the electron density, and the hole density are contributing to law. Following this way, now we have one equation for phi, n, and p. Two more equations are required. At equilibrium, special relations can be used. Under the Boltzmann statistics, only at equilibrium, the carrier densities are exponentially dependent on the electrostatic potential. It is possible because the quasi-fermi potentials are zero at equilibrium. By collecting Gauss law and these two relations, we can prepare a set of coupled equations with three unknown variables. Such a set of equations is used to calculate the equilibrium solution. However, its validity is limited only to the equilibrium case. For general non-equilibrium cases, what should we do? For general cases, other two equations are the electron whole continuity equation. The electron equation is shown here. The temporal change of the electron density is determined by the net incoming electron flux. The electron current density J sub n is written in terms of the potential and electron density. At the steady state, the time derivative term vanishes. Then we get one equation for phi and n for holes. A similar equation can be found. Therefore, by collecting Gauss law and two continuity equations, we can prepare a set of coupled equations with three unknown variables. Of course, the numerical calculation will be done by the computer program. That's it for this lecture 2. In the next lecture, analytic study on the PN junction will be presented. Later, those results will be verified against the device simulation results. Due to my business trip, the third and fourth lectures will be uploaded in my YouTube channel. No offline lecture is available for them. Thank you and see you later.